Welcome, everybody, to the Gym Master Show Live Entertainment Lifestyle Talk Show Series. How's everybody doing today? Hope you guys are doing well. It's so nice to see everybody here watching, possibly for the first time, or if you're one of our regular JMS Lovity viewers, we welcome you as well. If this is your first time joining us here on the Gym Masters Show Live, I'm your host, Jim Masters. I do this work professionally, working in television and radio station film, and we created this series as uh, sort of like an old school uh, talk show, Entertainment Lifestyle Variety Talk Show series, taking you back in time a little bit in terms of the warmth and the conversational style. You know, think Dick Cavett and uh, Johnny Carson, Regis, some of the greats with a modern twist and a modern vibe of today. It also plays off of my uh, professional work in television, radio, stage, and film, and we hope you guys are doing well. If you are uh, one of our regular viewers, uh, you can chat in our chat room. The chat room is available for the subscribers of our YouTube channel, Gym Masters TV, and those who uh, watch and support the Gym Masters Show Live. So those of you who would like to uh, chat amongst yourselves there, the chat room is available for you right now. We call it our exclusive JMS uh, live chat room available live right now when you subscribe to the YouTube channel. And don't forget to give all the episodes, including this one, a big hearty thumbs up like on our YouTube channel and you subscribe to our YouTube channel. You'll be notified about all of the episodes, all the specials, all the pop-up shows and everything else that we do here on our Entertainment Lifestyle Variety Talk Show series. We say hello. We see lots of comments already built up in the chat room amongst yourselves. So greetings to everybody. So nice to see everybody here. And thanks for your enthusiasm for our series where we've done just around 670 episodes live seven days a week and it's extraordinary and we've got an amazing guest joining us from chicago today yes he's a legend in the industry we're talking about world-class jazz trumpeter roger ingram joining us here he ranks among the finest jazz lead trumpet players in the music industry today in addition to being a world-renowned performer he's also an educator author and instrument designer he uh, presents master classes and brass clinics throughout the world and has performed as a soloist with high school, college, and professional jazz ensembles. And he also uh, has been a regular columnist for the British publication, The Brass Herald. As a session musician, Roger has played on hundreds of recordings, movie scores, commercials, including money, many of them. Among the many artists he has toured with include Wynton Marsalis, Harry Connick Jr., Ray Charles, Woody Herman, Maynard Ferguson, Tom Jones, Paul Anka, the Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra, Quincy Jones, Frank Sinatra, Chico O'Farrell, Louis Belson, and many others. At 16, he toured with a great Louis Belson uh, big band. And after graduating high school, he toured during the fall with a Quincy Jones big band on a tour to promote the Brothers Johnson. He went on to play lead trumpet with international pop star Tom Jones for six years. And in 1985, he joined the Woody Herman Orchestra on lead trumpet and remained with the orchestra until Woody's death in October 1987. And during his tenure with Woody's band, he recorded three albums, all of which were nominated for Grammy Awards. Roger also toured with Maine and Ferguson uh, in 1998, 99, and 92, recording three albums with Maynard's band. He later collaborated with trumpeter Arturo Sandoval on the Grammy Award winning album Danzen. And subsequently, there are a number of other Arturo Sandoval collection albums that uh, Roger actually appears on. And again, this is really just a short list of the incredible background that he has. He has also designed this wonderful, incredible trumpet. We're going to show this. We've got actually a little uh, photo we're going to show you of it, which is really, really amazing. Uh, he also uh, plays assistant principal trumpet with the American Federation of Musicians, City Chicago, Symphony of Chicago. In addition, he's one of the solo first uh uh, in this incredible prairie brass band of Arlington Heights. And we're going to talk about that in a minute too. His busy schedule, which is extraordinary, has included musical contracting, writing articles, performing on commercial jingles, big band recordings, live concert presentations, Broadway shows, star acts in the Chicago area as well. And, uh, and lots more. Again, He's uh, prolific in this industry. He loves what he does, and he's truly a legend, and it's an honor and a pleasure to have him here on the Gym Masters Show Live. You're seeing his fantastic photos there, but why don't we bring him in live and direct from his home in Chicago, Illinois, the incomparable, the one and only 
Roger Ingram. Put your hands together, folks. Thanks for joining us. And there he is. Roger, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure and an honor. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm very flattered that you would ask me to be on your show. And uh, three, what, 670 shows you've done. <laughs> so you're a busy man. I was going to say, and it's... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> and it's not even the day job, and it's been crazy. <laughs> oh, you, you, you must love what you do very much. Uh, that's, uh, that shows a lot of dedication on your part. Well, you can relate to having toured the world and having you and I were just chatting before we went live. I mean, 35 years on the road. I mean, you've certainly laid down your tracks and your mark. Um, what, early on for you, what were those inspirations that pointed you in the direction of first going into the arts and into music? But what was it specifically, Roger, about the trumpet that really spoke to your heart and soul? Well, you know, I, uh, I grew up in Los Angeles um, uh, in a little community called Eagle Rock, which is in northeast Los Angeles, uh, right up there against the San Gabriel Mountains, you know. And uh, I was born in 1957, but my father was born in 1903. Now, the reason why I was able to be born in 1957 is because my mother was born in 1923. She was 20 years younger than my father. And my father uh, was an amateur saxophone player. And he made his living as a commercial artist. And he worked out of, out of our home in Los Angeles. And my mother was a dressmaker. She uh, used to uh, do private contracting with a lot of the uh, movie studios, making uh, gowns for Paramount and MGM and... And she worked out of the house too. And so my parents were always home. And in those days in Los Angeles, we're talking about the 1960s and 1970s when I was growing up, um, there was a lot of uh, actual big band and jazz uh, radio stations on AM radio. And while my father was working, he would always have the uh, the radio on playing a lot of the great music. You know, I would hear Louis Armstrong and and Harry James and Sidney Bechet over the radio. And every mm -hmm. once in a while, when my dad was working and he was doing a magazine layout, and uh, his main uh, account was Santa Fe Railroad, and he was doing a lot of the advertising, he would stop and he would pick up a saxophone and just start playing to what he heard on the radio by ear, you know. And when I was about five years old, um, we had an old marimba in the house. And I, you know, I, I really loved my father and I was very close to him. And when he would start playing the saxophone, I would start trying to tap out the notes I heard on the radio on the marimba. And um, so I got interested in listening to music and trying to duplicate what I heard with, a, with an old marimba. And I became very interested in the different kinds of uh, jazz that were played on the radio, modern jazz and old big band jazz and, and what was considered uh, traditional jazz. So uh, music started happening for me as far back as I can remember. Um, I have two older brothers who were uh, saxophone players, and they started out on clarinet and flute, and then they eventually... Um, went to saxophone and there was a lot of competition between my two older brothers and my father because they all played saxophone and clarinet and they used to be very competitive and almost to the point to where it, it was, got very intense sometimes in the household and I decided that, you know, I wanted to be part of the band program in school and, you know, our our social circle started uh, becoming most of the band members in the school band program. But I decided I wanted to play a different instrument than what they did because I didn't want to be involved with those competitions and, you know, that kind of a atmosphere in our house. So I decided that I wanted to play the trumpet. And what made me want to play the trumpet was... It actually became kind of a tradition with us. I think it was every Sunday night, the, the Lawrence Welk TV show would be playing 
on TV and, and uh, we would sit down and have dinner and actually watch the Lawrence Welk show. And I saw uh, one of the uh, trumpet players come out in front of the band and play a solo. And I saw him and he sounded beautiful. It might have even been Warren Looning, but it was somebody who was a, a regular member of the Lawrence Welk Orchestra who had that who had that job on TV. And I loved the sound of the trumpet and I'd always already had been listening to uh, Louis Armstrong and Harry James yeah. and the trumpet to me seemed, well, I said, there's only three vowels, you know, and my brothers had been, you know, dealing with the keys of the saxophone and the clarinet. And I, I thought as an eight year old kid that it would be an easier instrument to play because there was only three vowels. Little did I know at the time that uh, everything else happens with your lips and, and, being able to uh, deal with the parcels, you know, but I took up the trumpet and uh, my uh, next to oldest brother sat down with me one night just before I was going to go in and join the, uh, the third grade orchestra. And he, he said, look, these are whole notes. These are half notes. These are quarter notes. These are eighth notes. These are 16th notes. These are, half note rest, these are quarter note rest, these are bars, these are time signatures, and these are key signatures. And he kind of gave me a crash course in one evening about how to read music. And I went into my first day in third grade band, and I was able to read everything they put in front of me. Mm. And of course, you know, we're dealing with some very simplistic music here, like, you know, go tell Aunt Rody and Lightly Row and things like that. But I was able to read music right away. And uh, I have to give credit to my brother, who actually ended up being a great teacher for me in that respect. So that got me started in the, uh, the, uh, the school band program. And in addition to that, I kept on playing by ear to all the records that my dad would be playing in the, in the house, you know, my father was born in 1903, so he still had his old, all of his old original 78 records that he had bought new in the 20s, you know, and so he was always playing those on the record player, and so there was a lot of music going on in the house, and uh, I was basically self-taught until, until I got into high school, and I didn't really take a trumpet lesson until I was uh, in eighth grade. So I was self-taught for about, I don't know, the first five years of my playing. I got an old Arbin's book and I read all the texts and I started learning how to do it on my own and playing by ear and being a, a member of the uh, school band program at Egrock Elementary School. So that's how it started for me. So what was, would you say, I mean, that we all have in our life's journey these doors that open up for us, or sometimes we have to find ways to open the doors ourselves. What were some of those opportunities that came your way that really opened the door where people started to notice Roger's incredible talent and they started bringing you in? When did that happen? Was there a pivotal moment or two in your life early on in your career where those moments you look back at now, Roger, to say, those were the moments that really got things going for me career-wide. Well, you have to realize that uh, my father was a freelance commercial artist and my mother was a freelance dressmaker. And we were basically living month to month. So there wasn't a lot of money in the, in the household at that time. And uh, I couldn't even afford trumpet lessons. That's why I was learning everything on my own. And because my father's main account was Santa Fe Railroad, Mr. Cookson, who worked at the corporate office in uh, Chicago, he knew my father had three kids. And every week he sent a stack of tickets for all the rides at Disneyland, because we lived up in Eagle Rock and the original Disneyland is down in Anaheim. So that was all my dad could really do to entertain the kids and be able to give us uh, some, some sort of recreation was he took me to Disneyland 
every single weekend. And there was a um, there was a uh, restaurant. It was an outdoor restaurant called the Carnation Plaza at Disneyland. And in those days, in the '60s, they had one of the great big bands there every weekend, and we were able to get into Disneyland for free and take the rides. And my dad would then say, "Let's go over to the Carnation Plaza." I heard Duke Ellington's band a number of times there. I heard. I heard uh, Maynard Ferguson's band and Buddy Rich's band, uh, Bob Crosby and the Bobcats. I even saw Louis Armstrong live uh, in 1967 on the Tomorrowland stage in Tomorrowland, you know, during the middle of the summer. And it was when I heard Woody Herman's band during one of those weekends. And I really paid close attention to the lead trumpet player on that band and the trumpet section. And I heard how wonderful that band sounded. And I, at that moment, I decided I want to be a lead trumpet player. And it might have been, it might have been Charlie Davis. It might have been, I heard Charlie Davis play lead with that band during those years. I heard Dave Stahl play lead with that band during those years. And I, got really excited about how what an invigorating uh, force within the configuration of a big band the lead trumpet player really was and i started noticing even in those young years just by listening how his relationship with the drummer kind of controlled the band so i decided what kind of a trumpet player i wanted to be by going to those concerts that that Basically, we were a very poor family, but my father loved music and he really wanted to support our interest in music. So he took me to Disneyland every weekend for years and I got to hear all those great bands, you know. So that was one of the first things that really prompted me to continue on with my interest in music and my studies and The second thing that was really important was when I entered seventh grade, uh, so I went into Egrock High School, it was, I think it was one of the very few high schools left in the Los Angeles Unified School District that had grades seven through 12 attend the same school. And the year before I joined or entered high school, uh, a new band director took over the band program there. His name was John Ronaldo, and he was a great trumpet player. And he also, besides being a teacher at the high school, he worked gigs, you know, in Los Angeles. He was a professional trumpet player, and he took over the entire band program there. So I had actually put myself through about a half or two thirds of the Ardman book on my own, just by reading the text. And, and I practiced all the time. I really loved it so much. I mean, it got to the point when I was eight, nine, 10 years old, I used to practice four five, six hours a day. And, and I was just a little kid. And when my arms got tired, I would just go lay down on my bed and lean the horn up against my face so I could keep on playing. And my parents, really supported me practicing but you have to realize remember they were working out of the house they said we just can't listen to you practice all day roger you know so they put me out into the backyard and so i would continue practicing out in the backyard so i didn't have a problem practicing and i i kind of i was kind of a shy kid and i didn't really have much going on until i discovered the trumpet and I really latched onto it and I really loved it. So I practiced and I practiced and then I finally got into seventh grade. This new band director who had taken off the taken over the program was a trumpet player. And so what happens when you go in t- in seventh grade and you sign up for band and the band director says, okay, well let me hear you play a few things. They want to see where he's going to place you, you know, what band you're going to put, you know, and he was impressed enough with my playing to where he put me on the first trumpet chair in all the senior bands. Mm. And it was a junior and senior high school yeah. uh, situation. So 
he thought I had a lot of a lot to offer and I was under his tutelage for six years. He was a professional trumpet player, John Ronaldo, you know. And so then the third thing that happened, which, you know, and so now I'm just totally into trumpet. I'm buying all the records. My dad's bringing me home bugle call books and Arvin books and because my dad loved loved his family and he was really supportive. And uh, so I got better and better. And I, I was always a good reader because of that time that my brother kind of gave me a crash course. This is what's happening with, with reading, you know. And uh, so when I got into about eighth or ninth grade, John Ronaldo, he said, you know, you should probably start taking some private trumpet lessons. And I said, well, you know, I, I would have been all this time, except that, you know, my family we kind of like live month to month and we can't really afford to be paying for trumpet lessons for me. And he said, I know that he goes, I know the situation there. He goes, listen, I have three or four, uh, how, uh, neighbors on my block and he only lived four blocks from us. And he said, they need to have their lawns mowed every week. And he goes, how about if I get you to start mowing their lawns and you can take that money and pay for trumpet lessons. So, mm. I started doing that, and he said, Here, there's a really great trumpet player who lives in South Pasadena, which is just a little town over from us. His name's Laroon Holt, and he plays second trumpet on the Lawrence Welk TV show, which is kind of ironic because it was the Lawrence Welk show that made me want to play trumpet to begin with. And he said he's a really good trumpet teacher and a really nice guy. How about you start mowing these people's lawns and you – go start studying with Laroon Holt. And so I did. And he, I, my first lesson with Laroon Holt, and he looked at the mouthpiece I, I was playing, and I didn't know one mouthpiece from another when I started playing trumpet. It, it ended up that it was a very kind of narrow rim, shallow cup mouthpiece. And he goes, you know, you can keep on playing that mouthpiece if you want but for our purposes i would like you to move to a bach mouthpiece so he moved me to a bach 10c you know mm. and he goes now here's this book called he says you've done pretty good for yourself with the arvin's book but i want us to start from the beginning again and i want you to go through it according to how i want you to approach playing that book and then he assigned me the Schlossberg book and the Clark's technical studies and the top tone for the trumpet. And he started having me learn like uh, the Haydn trumpet concerto. And he was a very good teacher. He was teaching me as if I was going to be an orchestral player. And he goes, I know you're not interested in being an orchestral player, but this is where you get your technique. You have to, you have to embrace the orchestral field to get your technique, even though I know you want to be a lead trumpet player with a jazz band. He goes, but you got to do this, you know? So I did everything he asked me to do. And I studied with him for about three or four years until one day, the fourth thing happened. John Ronaldo, and you remember, he was a working trumpet player in Los Angeles. He was working with this uh, little, uh, band led by a drummer named Steve Heidig. And they had the gig at the top of the Holiday Inn in downtown Hollywood. It was it was kind of a dance gig, you know. And they would have players like Jerome Richardson and Cat Anderson and um, Br Brett Woodman would play this gig because it was kind of like doing a club date, you know. I mean, all these famous players, they still take club dates, you know, and still do dances and things. So one day in about ninth grade, one morning, John Ronaldo was really excited. He goes, Roger, come over here. I want to talk to you. He goes, I just finished working with this new trumpet player who just moved here from Las Vegas, and he's a great lead player, and he's a great jazz soloist, and his name's Bobby Shue, and he just moved here, and he's taking on students. He goes, I think that you should simultaneously – keep studying with Laroon Holt, who's showing me all the classical stuff, and study with Bobby Shue. Because 
John Ronaldo couldn't teach me privately mm. because there was uh, some sort of a stipulation with the uh, Los Angeles Unified School District where you couldn't take private lessons from one of your regular teachers because it might, uh, I think, I think the thought behind it was it might show favoritism towards one student or the other. So he couldn't teach me, you know, so he kept on suggesting teachers for me to study with. And so I contacted Bobby Shu, which if, if, if you don't know Bobby Shu, he's a world-class jazz soloist and educator and lead trumpet player. He's just wonderful, you know? And so I started studying with Bobby Shu and Bobby Shu started showing me things about chord changes started introducing me to players of uh, wonderful jazz artists like blue mitchell and uh, bill evans and he started having me he he actually taught me how to listen you know a lot of people kind of like listen to music and they talk to their friends bobby said when you listen to a record put on a pair of headphones and really listen to the record you know you know analyze it so i started doing that and i got you know, I started making a lot of progress as, you know, a kid playing lead trumpet with his high school band in Los Angeles. I started getting known as one of the better lead trumpet players in high school. And John Ronaldo was a, a real go-getter. We entered all the jazz the big band competitions and everything and all the Hollywood Bowl contests and and uh, and I would say the next big thing that happened was between my 11th and 12th grade years, um, through Bobby Shu, who was the lead trumpet player on Louis Bellison's band, right before a summer tour of Canada, one I think the third trumpet player had to bail out for some reason. Something happened with his family or something. He couldn't do the tour. Now, this was 1974, and you have to realize that in those years, there was tons of festivals going on in Europe and the United States, jazz festivals. I mean, it, they were rampant, you know, and they couldn't find anybody to fill that chair and Bobby Shue was the lead trumpet player, and they were kind of scrambling. And Bobby went to Louis Belson. and he said, look, I got this kid. You know, he plays first trumpet with the Eagle Rock High School Jazz Band. And he's a great reader, and he's going to be a really good lead trumpet player. And, and I'll ask his mom and his dad if if he can go on the road with the band. So, and I was 16, you know, I'd never even been on an airplane, you know, my family couldn't afford to take vacations or anything. So Bobby Shue called my, my, my dad and my mom and dad said, yeah, take him, get, get him out of the house, you know? So I went and did that 10 day tour with Louis Bellson's band. And I played third and Bobby threw me some lead charts to play and I got to sit right in between Blue Mitchell and Bobby Shue for that entire tour. Now, the, the trumpet section was was Blue Mitchell, me, Bobby Shue, Stu Blumberg, Frank Zabo, and Kat, I think Cat Anderson was on the tour. Frank Rosalino was sitting right in front of me. And uh, Ray Brown was the bass player. Nat Pierce was playing piano. I mean, it was an all-star band. And I was this kid. And Bobby Shue was my parental guardian for a 10 day tour, you know. <laughs> what was that like? Were you pinching yourself? <laughs> well, I was, you know. And in fact, the first gig we did, um, in those days, you, you would take a flight from LA and you go to Detroit and you would transfer to another flight and we flew into Toronto. And on the the transfer blue mitchell missed the flight mm. and so when we got there we were supposed to go uh take transportation right to varsity stadium and do the first hit we were going to do the first gig right off the plane and the person who we were opening for was dizzy gillespie and bobby shoe was was really good friends with dizzy you know dizzy loved bobby and Dizzy was already there warming up. And so when we got there, 
Bobby went into Dizzy Gillespie's dressing room. He said, hey, Dizzy. And they gave her, her, you know, it's like, hey, it's great to see you. And he said, listen, Blue Mitchell missed a flight. Would you mind playing in the section with Louis band, you know, for the concert that we're actually playing to open for you? And Dizzy said, man, I haven't played with a big band like that for years. Sure, I'll do it. And so Dizzy Gillespie is sitting right next to me. And then on the other side of me is Bobby Shue. And right in the middle of the first tune comes running up Blue Mitchell because he made the very next flight and he got went right to the stadium, you know, the varsity stadium, which I think is a different name now, you know. And so now Blue got out his horn. Now he's sitting next to Dizzy. So now it's Blue Mitchell, Dizzy Gillespie, and just little me, I'm sitting there. And then Bobby Shue and Stu Blomberg and Frank Zabo and Cat Anderson. So when and Blue uh, Louis Belson sitting there playing drums, and he looked over and he saw that Blue had run up and joined the section, and he's got Dizzy Gillespie there. And it's a really fast rhythm changes tune, you know. And Louis Belson yells out, open up letter F, right? And because, you know, I mean, being a smart band leader, he says, I got all these guys in the section. He opened it up and they took fours for like 20, you know, traded choruses and eights and fours for like 20 minutes. So there's Dizzy Gillespie, Blue Mitchell. And I'm just sitting there just like, <laughs> what? You know, just because I was, that was the first gig of the tour. And it was already, that had happened, you know. And so Dizzy plays about five courses. And then Blue gets up and plays about five courses. And Bobby Shue takes a bunch of courses. And they go back and forth, back and forth. And I'm right in the middle of it. And that was my first road gig I ever did. And then after that, tour was over. I went back to high school and I finished 12th grade. <laughs> I mean, you That's want funny. To ask how that is happened? amazing. It's, it's all that stuff that happened before it's 12th like, grade. You know, and, <laughs> A lot and of that usually really, happens. That happens after 12th grade. You had it already going early. That's amazing. Oh, and, and then, so I, I finished 12th grade and, and I had, and I got, I won the audition to do uh, the Monterey Jazz Festival High School All-Star Stage Band. Yeah. And, and that same summer, I, wow. I, went, I went up to Monterey and played. And I got the backup uh, Dizzy again. And Jerry Mulligan and John Lewis on piano. And, and then, excuse me, uh, after 12th grade, I, I won that audition again. So I did that festival again, you know. And... So then I graduated high school in uh, June of 75 and I continued studying and, and, and I, then I became on the uh, rotation for subs on Louis Belson's band. So I started doing gigs at Dante's with Louis Belson's band, you know, so I started kind of working in LA, you know, <laughs> I graduated high school and then Quincy Jones's office called me and, you know, I, the only time I was really associated with Quincy Jones was just that one tour, you know? Um, and I did, he had just finished producing the brothers Johnson's album and he wanted to go on the road. He wanted young faces. He wanted young kids. And I was, you know, just 17, and they put together a, a band from all the different high schools and the graduates from the different high schools. And in, in the trumpet section was me and uh, um, uh, Bobby Rodriguez and Ray Brown, Ray Brown, the trumpet player, and uh, Danny Cortez. And my roommate was Tom Kubis and uh, Ted Nash, who's the lead alto player with Lincoln Center now, he was making all the rehearsals and then he found out that he was too young to travel so he couldn't do the tour, you know. So, but Quincy was there and it was a short tour 
in the fall of 76. And that's the only time I ever really worked with Quincy Jones. And I've run into him a few times and he's, you know, great guy. But, you know, there's so many great uh, trumpet players that have been heavily associated with Quincy Jones during all these years. And I'm not one of them. I just did that one tour when I was a kid. I mean, trumpet players like Oscar Bashir and Bobby Bryant and Buddy Childers and Cat Anderson and Jerry Hay and Chuck Finley. Those are the guys who really should be credited with having long-term associations with Quincy Jones. I mean, Quincy remembers me from that one little tour that we did. And but I wasn't really heavily associated with him, you know, and uh, so I mean, I got to do that. And then, you know, once you go on the road with one thing, you meet a lot of people and it starts snowballing. Mm -hmm. and then I spent a year traveling with Connie Stevens, I was her lead oh, trumpet yeah. player, and we started doing uh, she had a Vegas type act, right? We, we we would do the Holiday House in Pittsburgh, and we would do the Sahara in Las Vegas. And I, I traveled with her for about a year, and then after that, um, I got the call from Tom Jones when I was eighteen to go out and tour with him. And I stayed with him for six years, and we would be on the road for ten months a year. So, I mean, I, I was just basing myself out of Los Angeles. And Tom was just a beautiful guy, a wonderful singer. I mean, he brought it to the table every single time he went on stage. And uh, his son, Mark Woodward, I mean, he is still managing his dad. And he's still going. Yeah. And, and both of them, I mean, he had a wonderful family. He has a big heart. And uh, I... I worked with him for about six years, you know, it's like, that it, it was a great experience for me. And I, I, you know, I learned how to do shows. I became a, a kind of a commercial pop player for a while. What were the years you were with him? Um, from 76 until the beginning of 82. Mm, yeah. You know, so I worked with him and after that, I, uh, I lived in Las Vegas for a few years and I worked on what's called a relief band. It was yeah. the off night band for all the hotels. And I did yeah. that until the, uh, the hotels started going to tape. Mm. And then when that happened, I moved back to Los Angeles and I freelanced, uh, I moved back to LA in 84 and I freelanced for about a year. And then Ron Stout, who's this wonderful jazz trumpet player who was on Woody Herman's band, they called me to go out and play lead with Woody. So in May of 85, I joined Woody Herman's band, and I stayed there uh, through Woody's very last concert in 87. I did three albums with him, uh, Woody's Gold Star, the, the, the 50th anniversary tour, and we re-recorded uh, Stravinsky's Ebony Concerto with Richard Stoltzman as the soloist. We did, did that album. Incredible. And then after Woody passed away, um, I left the band for a while, and I uh, joined Maynard Ferguson's band. So, I mean, I just started staying on the road. I went on the road, on the road, and after Maynard's tour, Harry Connick Jr., this guy I had never heard of, started his big band in 1990 and i stayed there until 2010 you know so i yeah. mean you know i i spent a lot of time on the road mm -hmm. and i mean i i lived in los angeles and i lived in new york but i was basically basing myself out of those cities now this is with harry and i think at the super bowl right with harry yeah, Connick jr we played the uh the national anthem at the Super Bowl. What was that like for you? That must have been cool, huh? It was really cool, you know, and we all got to see the game. And, uh, you know, that was at the height of his popularity. Yes. I mean, he started a big band and, and he, you know, I saw that I'd never really heard of him when they asked me to go out. And Dan Miller called me. Dan Miller's wonderful uh, lead and jazz trumpet player mm. said hey roger i had just gotten off back to my apartment from a maynard ferguson tour he goes he called me up he goes there's this guy named harry connick jr he's putting a big band together and, and i thought he had said ray conniff i said ray conniff he's <laughs> ray still Conniff's alive singers you know? yeah and i and he said no 
he's a great piano player and singer and he did the soundtrack for when harry met sally and that's right and so i uh i said i didn't you know i had just finished a tour with maynard and i didn't have anything on the books i said okay i'll go out and see i'll try it because because he said in the bands there's jerry weldon and dave schumacher and dan was going to be on the band and leroy jones dan miller starts mentioning all the great players that were going to be on this band i said well yeah i'll go out and do it you know and then once i got there i started you know quickly i saw that this guy harry connick jr a, really a incredibly multi-talented cat man you know I mean, he arranges yeah, and sings and acts, and he, he plays the heck out of the piano, you know. That whole New Orleans so, vibe. I yeah. stayed there for a while, you know. And then we did the Blue Light, Red Light album, and uh, we did the Super Bowl. And so I started, and, you know, so I start. I stayed there for a while. And then in the beginning of 1993, he decided to break up the big man which I, I didn't think that was the best decision for him. I mean, if, if a formula is working, stick with it, you know? Sure. And he, he decided to start a funk band, you know? He yeah. did that for a few years, and I wasn't involved with the funk band. So, and by then, I was already uh, living in New York, and I also had a place down in Miami. I was going back and forth. And uh, I had gotten... Uh, kind of a full ride at the University of Miami because you got to realize I never went to college. I never had a degree. I still don't have a degree because I did my first year towards my undergrad after Harry broke up the band. I moved to Miami and I was living with Billy Spencer and Dante Luciani was living at, in the same apartment complex and we were playing it with the uh, University of Miami jazz band under the direction of Witt Seidner. And so we were doing that. And then I finished my first year and then went Marcella called me up and asked me if I'd moved to New York and play lead trumpet with the Lincoln Center Jazz Orchestra. <laughs> so that was the end of my college career. You know, I but didn't these have phone calls that you've gotten have been really good. <laughs> yeah, your life is always one phone call away from completely changing, you know. And so I I went to New York and I started working with Lincoln Center and we recorded Blood on the Fields, which won the first Pulitzer Prize in jazz. Unbelievable. And we did another record called They They Came to Swing. And they, we did a third record called Real Time. So I'm working up there in New York with Wenton. And I also kept a place in Miami. I was going back and forth. So I started working for, with this with this uh, trombone player who was the the biggest contractor at the time for all the shows and everything down in Miami, his name is Peter Graves. And, and he was, you know, I loved working for Peter Graves and he had, he had all the work down there. He got the call to contract Frank Sinatra's band for a Southern tour in 1996. So I got to go out and do this tour. Now, you you know, a lot of people, because I mentioned I got to do a Frank Sinatra tour, I was just in the trumpet section. I was playing second trumpet. The guy playing lead trumpet was Walt Johnson, who, who's, a, who's a great lead trumpet player. I mean, you can't really associate me with Frank Sinatra because I just did one 10-day tour. I mean, the great uh, lead trumpet players. And Walt Johnson played lead trumpet with Frank Sinatra for like, I think 20 years. But one 10 day, 10 day tour, I tell you, is not something that everybody could say they well, did. Well, that's why I mentioned it. But, it yeah. but it's like, to be it's fair to terrific. like Walt Johnson and the, the lead player before him was Buddy Childers. long term Childers, people, yeah. And the lead player before Buddy Childers was Charlie Turner. Those guys had great association for decades with Frank Sinatra. I, I did one 10 day tour and Walt Johnson... I knew him from when I grew up in L.A. and a wonderful lead trumpet player. And because he knew me, when I did that tour, he threw me three or four lead parts to play. But he was the main guy, you know. Yeah. So so I, you can't it's, – it's almost unfair to those guys to really associate me closely with Quincy Jones and, and Walt Johnson because those are the guys who 
really paid the dues with those two guys. I mean, with, uh, you know, uh, Quincy, it was Oscar Bashir and Bobby Bryant, and Buddy Childers, and Jerry Hay and Chuck Finley. But, you know, I mean, I did get the tour with both those people. And it was. It, what did it had, you learn from the, those icons? Uh, touring with Quincy Jones, even if briefly, touring with Frank Sinatra 10 days. What did you pick up from each of them and just watching their style and what they bring to the table and working with, you know, the musicians that they had assembled? What did you uh, sort of absorb from each of those iconic figures? Well, from the seat of an orchestra member, because first of all, when I was doing the Quincy Jones tour and when I was doing the Frank Sinatra tour, the primary thing that you're thinking about is to take care of business, is to, to nail your part and watch the conductor. Now, on the Quincy Jones tour, Quincy was a conductor. On the Frank Sinatra tour, Frank Sinatra Jr. was a conductor. And after you've done a gig or two and you feel comfortable with everything, I started making observations about seeing what's going on and watching Frank and being able to really see what was going on with Frank Sinatra. And the thing I remember about Frank, and you got to remember, this was the second to his last tour. So he started forgetting lyrics. And they had huge teleprompters running for him with all the lyrics. And he was even saying, man, I'm forgetting the lyrics, but I still love this tune. You know, the thing I noticed about Frank, Mr. Sinatra, so even though he was forgetting the lyrics, he swung his butt off. He never lost his sense of time, his sense of phrasing, and his sense of showmanship. He was a true a genius performer. I mean, that's what I got out of that tour, just his showmanship. And he just accepted the fact that he was forgetting the lyrics, even with these teleprompters going in front of him with the lyrics running down. But he swung so hard yeah. that the crowds were just going nuts for him. They loved it, right? You exactly. know, and it's like, you know, the the people that, that I really uh, – had long tenures with were Woody Herman, Maynard Ferguson, yeah. Harry Connick Jr. And, you know, those are the people that I'm more closely associated with. And you also and worked I, with Paul Anka too, right? I worked with Paul Anka for a number of tours. Yeah. And the last one I worked with him is 2008. And again, with Paul Anka, he is like a classic iconic showman and you know the thing that started paul anka was he was he's a songwriter first of all yes you know? and Did he, he co-write or wasn't he responsible for uh, the tonight show theme with johnny oh, carson yeah you know yeah. he wrote that i mean the list of songs that he wrote that mm. that other uh people made famous yeah had, you know i mean he wrote he had an ability to write tunes that the general public gravitated to. And he he also wrote the lyrics for a lot of those tunes. And it's like, there's really an art to being able to write songs with the with the, just the right chord progression and the yeah. lyrics that the general public will gravitate to. And he has been extremely successful at doing that, you know? Yeah. And, um, uh, and when I was, you know, I was out with, with Anka, you know, we never had a problem with Anka. I mean, he knows what he wants and he's very definite about what he wants. You know, it's just like, but you just show up and you be professional and you keep your mouth shut and you do your gig, you know? Right. So, you know, so, I mean, I spent a lot, a lot of time with him and, uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm 64 years old now. You know, and uh, I'm very a wee happy. young lad. <laughs> I'm here in, in uh, Chicago, and I, you know, it's like I'm this is one of the rare days where I'm not working. 
I you know. know you and I had planned uh, a couple of weeks ago, but then you got a phone, another phone call and you, you had to fill in or sub in or get in there quick and, and rearrange. I, well, the, the, uh, the, it's well, amazing. The, the trumpet player who was uh, playing Titanic, the musical, he had tested positive for COVID. So I had to go in and read the show cold on the show. And uh, after I did it, they said, can you stay the week? So I, I did a whole week at Titanic, the musical. But, you know, I'm also in, involved with a lot. Of, there's a lot of great big bands here in Chicago. And I'm primarily known as a, a big band lead trumpet player who plays in the jazz style, you know. And I'm, I work with the Pete Elman Big Band, the Joshua Jern Jazz Orchestra. Um, I, I just got booked to, to do the entire summer with the Chicago Jazz Orchestra. Oh, I work with the New Standard Jazz Orchestra, the Shout Section Big Band, and the APOL, which stands for the Association of uh, Professional Orchestra Leaders. It's with the Chicago Big Band. I work with them because I'm also an orchestra leader. I work with the Bill Byam Big Band, the Metro Star Orchestra, the uh, the uh, the Mulligan Mosaics Big Band, the Heritage Jazz Orchestra, and every Thursday night I'm at the Green Mill with the Alan Grasick Swing Orchestra. So like, I mean, and on top of that, I I do a lot of sessions during the day. We just did an album for Mark Tremonte, who is like one of the co-founders of Creed. He just did a Sinatra album, yes. which is going to be released on. May 27th is called Mark Tremonte Sings Frank Sinatra. And I played lead trumpet on the entire album. Wow. And uh, it's Incredible. The, it's the original Frank Sinatra charts because the, the guy who conducted the session and contracted the session is Mike Smith, who lives here in Chicago. And he was Frank Sinatra's lead alto saxophone player for 20 years. Mm. You know, so, I mean, that's coming out. And so I do a lot of recording and I'm playing these concerts. We just did uh, with the Chicago Jazz Orchestra with another singer named Paul Marinaro. We did the entire Live at the Sands album with Basie's band. We recreated that at the uh, Studebaker Theater here in Chicago last week, you know, and I play lead on the whole thing, you know. So, you know, I'm not on the road anymore. Because you miss I, it, or you're happy not to be. I have a family, right? We we have a nice home here in Lagrange, which is uh, in the western suburbs of Chicago. It's about 17 miles due west of downtown Chicago, and you know we have two families of bunnies living in our yard, and <laughs> we have a kitty, and you know, I mean, you met Vicky, and yes, uh, you know, we've been She's married terrific. now for. 12 years i've been wow. living here for 14 years and if if someone makes it worth it i'll go back out maybe and do some short tours yeah you know? but i mean i did 35 years i did 35 years as a single man you know i mean i really had to get off the road after 35 years because i wasn't grounded I didn't have a family to answer to. I could basically do whatever I want. There was a there was a period of time when I was living in New York where I was simultaneously playing lead trumpet for Paul Anka, Harry Connick Jr., and Ray Charles. And when the tours would overlap, I'd send in a sub to the one that paid the least. Yeah. I mean, I was touring with all those bands at the same time. Same time. And I, I had an apartment up on the Upper West Side, you know, like Broadway in 106. I had a beautiful apartment building, but I was never there. <laughs> I, my roommate was Greg Gisbert, who's this wonderful jazz trumpet player. And, and he, you know, he's like uh, the one of the main solos with the Maria Schneider Orchestra. And, you know, and he lives in Denver now. 
But we we had an apartment there, but neither one of us w- was ever in it. You know, you had a chance there. to enjoy it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> paid the rent, but you didn't get a chance to enjoy it. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, it got, it got to the point where I kind of had to get off the road. Yeah. It just, you know, it had to be. You know. Yeah, exactly. It it had to be. Hey, I've got a couple of we've got some music we're going to share too, but we've got uh, a couple of cool photos we dug up here. Maybe you can take us through them. Look at this. Yeah, well, that was backstage at the Metropolitan Opera House in New York. Uh, Winton had written a ballet for the Alvin Ailey Ballet Company, and uh, and I played lead trumpet on that for the entire run. And John Faddis came to hear. The uh, Winton's work, you know, because Winton and Faddis are very close, and and I've known John since I was eighteen. When, I, mm. like I told you, I was doing that Monterey Jazz Festival High School yeah. All Star Stage Band. Well, when John was just twenty one, he was doing short tours with Chuck Mangione. When Chuck Mangione had the full symphony orchestra, yeah. And so on one of the days during the week-long festival, uh, Lad McIntosh was the band leader. He said, well, Roger, this, on this day today, you're not going to play lead trumpet. Uh, Chuck Mangione is bringing in his own lead trumpet player. And so he brought in a 21-year-old John Faddis. Mm. And I was like uh, 16, and I, and I played second. And that's the first time I met Fattis. He at the Monterey yeah. Jazz Festival when Chuck Manzione brought him in, and I immediately yeah. saw. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what, what, I mean, you know, John yeah. Fattis has incre- incredible high chops, but he people sometimes don't give him the credit for being an all around great trumpet yeah. player. I mean, exactly. This, yeah. He just so so I have a history of John Fattis, and but that's where. That photo was taken backstage at the Metropolitan yeah. Opera House uh, in between shows for this ballet I was playing with the Lincoln Center Jazz Orchestra. There's me and Tony Lujan and the great Clark Terry. And you see Frank Green there, who's a, a wonderful lead trumpet player that I've known for years. In fact, he's uh, the current lead trumpet player with the Count Basie right, band right now. You see him uh, in the upper left there. And this was backstage at the Newport Jazz Festival. I was there uh, playing a concert with Harry Connick Jr.'s band, and Clark Terry was there. And Tony Lujan, who I've known since my days in Vegas, he was there playing. And so he asked uh, Clark Terry if we could take a photo with him. So this was just backstage before we were getting ready to go on, and so there's Frank Green and me and Clark Terry and Tony Lujan. And look at Tony. Look how happy he looks, man. <laughs> because Clark Terry was one of his main mentors, you know. And you should hear Tony play. He's a, a wonderful player, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, look at this. Oh, that's the record with the, uh, with the uh, new standard jazz orchestra called uh, Waltz About Nothing. Uh, the New Standard Jazz Orchestra is co-led by Andy Baker and Ken Partika. And uh, you see Mar- Marcus Held back there. And, uh, yeah, uh, Chuck Parrish and I split the lead trumpet book on that band, and on the record. Now, that band hasn't played in a while because, unfortunately, we uh, a couple of the members have passed away. Yeah. So uh, we're regrouping right now. But uh, it's a it's a great band. It's one of the bands I work with here in Chicago. You know, yeah. And, and uh, so yeah, what what a beautiful session that was. That must have been yeah. I mean, there's nothing like when you're all together and you're jamming and you're doing your thing. It's it's a fantastic feeling. I'm sure. Here's another great shot. Look at this. That is with the Pete Allen Big Band, and uh, the, the two records we've done two records. The one. The first one was called for Pete's ache and we, and it was, you know, highly critically claimed, you know, and uh, we also released an, an album of last Christmas called the 12 grooves of Christmas. And they both came out on my record company. 
Vicky and I started a record company called One Two Tree, O N E T O O T R E E. We have One Two Tree Records and we have One Two Tree Publishing and we have One Two Tree Products. You know, one of the things I did after I got off the road is that Vicky and I started uh, a few businesses. Look at this. One of your fabulous designs. Yeah, it's one of the best-selling B-flat trumpets on the market. It's uh, produced by uh, the Jupiter Band Instrument Company. Their professional line of instruments is called Exo Brass. And this is the Exo Brass 1600i. And they they use the, the, uh, the letter I because my last name starts with I. It's a 1600i B flat trumpet, and it's uh, and I love it. I play it exclusively. Mm. Yeah. And there we are doing a uh, a film with the Joshua Jern Jazz Orchestra, uh, and we've done a, a couple of records with Josh too. Any one of these bands that I mentioned that I work with here in Chicago, all you have to do is Google the Joshua Jern Jazz Orchestra, or Google the Pete Elman Big Band or Google the New Standard Jazz Orchestra or Google the Chicago Jazz Orchestra and you'll find information that leads you to their websites and it'll let you know how to contact them if you'd like to, you know, use the band. Yeah. Good looking group here, huh? All spissy, spiffy with the blue ties. Well, you know, I do a lot of club dates too. I did a club date yesterday, you know. Yeah. I mean, uh, we do weddings, uh, you know, uh club dates weddings bar mitzvahs uh uh, per, uh you know commercial kind of uh mm -hmm. production shows that's the bread and butter of the music business you know yeah here we are in the studio we uh, i i just finished doing some overdubbing with um for the pete elman band there's jim massoff on the left he has a great little studio out there called crystal recorder studio and there's Kerry Deadman next to me on the other side. He's a, he's like one of the best producers of records here in town. And then on the very right there, that's Pete Elman. So uh, Kerry Deadman produced uh, the last record for Pete Elman called uh, The Twelve Grooves of Christmas. Mm, very, very cool. You know, speaking of which, we'll go back to a couple of those uh, photos in a second. We actually have a clip here that we dug up which is really really nice um this is with the jj jazz orchestra this is amazing grace tell us about this one well uh i, I did uh, is this the live version or is this the, the recorded version i think this is actually not sure i think it looks like it's live yeah i played the flugelhorn solo and the trumpet solo at the end uh, so I did the whole thing, and on the record, uh, Joshua Jern played the flugelhorn solo, and then I played the trumpet solo at the end. Uh, Joshua Jern, he's a great lead and jazz trumpet player, and he's on the band every Thursday night at the Green Mill with Alan Grasick. You know, so yeah. we work every Thursday together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There is that gang, Amazing Grace. Enjoy it, and then we'll be back with our special guest, Legendary jazz trumpeter Roger Ingram joining us live from Chicago. If this is your first time here, I'm your host, Jim Masters. Welcome to our Entertainment Lifestyle Variety Talk Show series. If you haven't had a chance to subscribe to our channel, it's Jim Masters TV. Thanks for all of the great enthusiasm we're seeing in the live chat and the super chat. Uh, Marty Thompson watching, and he gave a super chat and says hello as well. And we appreciate all of that. Here's Amazing Grace, gang.
That's really nice, my friend. That's really nice. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's it, basically on that particular gig, I'm just playing the simple melody on flugel. I didn't improvise on that particular one. And the simple melody uh, at the end, up an octave on the trumpet. It's such a sweet sound. It's such a sweet tune. And, and, uh, Months later, I played that same solo at my father-in-law's funeral, who passed away October 17th of last year, and I played uh, Amazing Grace at the gravesite for the family and the friends. So it means a lot to me when I hear that. Um, the Joshua Jernet Orchestra, it's, of all the bands I play with, it's... it's very refreshing to me because Josh is a, a great writer. And he writes in a very uh, refreshing manner and he's continuing to do a lot of different projects and he's getting ready to record another album. And uh, it's, you know, it's just another one of the Chicago projects that I feel very fortunate to be involved with, with all the different bands I play with, you know, and I'm looking forward to doing uh, uh, at the Jazz Showcase here in Chicago, starting in June, every single Monday from 5.30 in the afternoon till 7 o'clock in the evening with the great Chicago Jazz Orchestra mm -hmm. for the entire month of June, July, and August, you know. And so I'm going to be playing Lee Trumpet with them. and. You know, uh, I was making a list prior to doing the interview today of all the different groups I I play with because, you know. It's amazing. That's a long list. <laughs> it, it's, all, it's all about live music and to come out and support the band. And and Vicky was saying, well, oh, oh, here's another one. Here's another one. So it's like I'm looking at this list and it's like, you know, uh, uh the Mulligan Mosaics Band, the Heritage Jazz Orchestra. We're doing a big tribute to Ella Fitzgerald coming up, doing all of her yes. music. And, you know, it's like I'm very. You worked with Ray Charles. I worked with Ray Charles for three years. And I, I did a, um, a a video that was filmed at the Montreux Jazz Festival. And I did. And I'm playing lead trumpet on all that. And uh, another one that was filmed at the. It was down in Miami for, I think it was called the House of the Blind. You know, it's for a, a group down there. I'm not sure if that's the exact name. There's so many different ones I've been on. I can't remember the exact names of everybody. But you asked me if I miss being on the road. Well, especially with the way the world is now and with flying and, uh, you know, the COVID thing happened and, there's a lot of tension in Europe right now. I don't really uh, care about going out and doing a lot of extensive traveling right now. I'm busy enough here, you know. I mean, uh, I, I love the musical community here. And, uh, you know, I'm very grateful that and flattered that someone like you would ask me to be on his show and and answer questions and talk about my career. Sometimes I think the word legendary is overused. You know, I mean, I've certainly never said that about myself. You're very but, humble. Yes. Well, a lot of people like to attach that word and I'm kind of like, you know, I, <laughs> just doing your thing. I've been a good lead trumpet player all my life. And what I like about living here in Chicago is especially all these club dates I do now It's here's a funny thing. Like when you talk about a wedding or a corporate uh, show or a bar mitzvah, each city has their own term for that. Here in Chicago, they really call them jobbing dates. Mm. Out in Los Angeles, they call them casuals. Yes. And in New York, they call them club dates. In club Miami, dates. they call them club dates. In Boston, they call them general business dates. That's right. And, and I've lived in all those cities except for um, – Boston. And and I like the New York term actually more than anything. And I Love hear it. people a lot of, give me a lot of crap and say, man, you're talking about a jobbing date. You know, I said, yeah, it's a club date, you know, so. Exactly. But even some of the greatest players that, you know, like 
famous jazz musicians, you'll see them doing club dates, man. Because, sure. like I said, that's the bread and butter of the music business is doing live dates. And that's what I'm saying. Come out and support live music. You know, it's like, come out and hear Pete Elman's band, which plays at this really nice new uh, venue in Aurora. It's called The Venue. And we're there every Tuesday night. And we start playing at uh, 6.30 and we go to 9 o'clock with Alan Grasick Swing Orchestra. That's at the famous Green Mill. We start every Thursday night at 8 o'clock and we go to midnight. And the Heritage Jazz Orchestra is always doing a lot of interesting gigs. We got one coming up uh, at this um, place called the Untitled, Untitled Supper Club. Untitled Supper Club. <laughs> And uh, and I do club dates with the Metro Star Orchestra. And, you know, um, I'm very happy here with, um, with the, oh, that's with the, um, uh, the Chicago Educators uh, uh, Symphony Orchestra. And we do a lot of dates there. And that's the whole trumpet section. That's a Chicagoland uh, Symphony Orchestra. And, which is run by, uh, conducted by Brian Miller. And so, you know, I, I've actually, since the days of Harry Connick Jr., when I was, that's uh, with Woody Herman's band there, or, or under the direction of Frank Tiberi. Uh, since I've moved to Chicago, I have been playing uh, a, assistant principal in a lot of symphony orchestras here. I've, I've actually, I feel I've matured in, as a player, I play C trumpet and piccolo trumpet and E flat cornet. And I'm involved with a lot of uh, orchestral type of situations now. And, and also doing a lot of Broadway shows, you know. So uh, I play every Wednesday morning with the Oak Park Trumpet Ensemble. And, and what we do is just all classical music. Mm. And uh, nice. a, a great trumpet player who used to work with the CSO is John Sianovich. And he's there all the time. There, there I am with uh, the Velvet Fog. Mel Torme, huh? It's, yeah. And he was, I loved working with, with, with Mel Torme. You know, he, he was a uh, perfect pitch, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, thank you. So, you know, there's a, uh, what band is that? Which yeah, one? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's the new uh, standard jazz orchestra at uh, the Jazz Showcase. And, really uh, fantastic. Yeah. And it, that's a concert we just did at the Studebaker Theater. Um, I played lead trumpet on that. It was the Chicago Jazz Orchestra under the direction of Jeff Lindbergh with Paul Marinaro is, was the uh, guy who did all of Sinatra, sang all of Sinatra's parts. He did a wonderful job hmm. and uh that's like some of the best musicians in town right there i'm really happy that i'm going to be doing the whole run at the uh jazz showcase this summer with them so you know uh there's uh mulligan mosaics under the direction of ted hogarth it's a band that uh plays all the music that jerry mulligan wrote and also arrangements at al Khan and uh bill holman it's a celebration of uh oh there's me there's my wife and me and, uh, <laughs> there's me <laughs> right <laughs> yeah she is. and uh that's a tribute to ray charles that uh that uh i did yeah uh, not too long ago the guy does a great job yeah there we are in a recording studio after just finishing uh, Pete Elman's record called The Twelve Grooves of Christmas, produced by Carrie Deadman. I played lead on that whole album. And uh, there we yeah, are. Dave Katz. Dave Katz, a wonderful player, a wonderful human being, in fact, you know, wonderful jazz soloist, you know. Yeah, that was uh, the run we did for uh, Chicago, the uh, the Broadway show Chicago. You know, I subbed on that show in New York for like seven years. Mm -hmm. I used to get to sit next to John Frost whenever I would go in and sub on that show. That's a real fun show to play. Tim Burke, great trumpet player, uh, done every Broadway show imaginable. He's like you know, he does so well at that stuff, you know, and, uh, yeah. and also, a, a Woody Herman alumni, 
And wh where was that? Oh, yeah, that's that Ray Charles show we did. Yeah. That's great. Ah, that's uh, I Titanic. just I just finished doing that. That was Titanic the musical. That's, that's right. when I w had to go in there and sub for uh, my friend when he who got uh, COVID. There we are up there in the loft. You also write f have written for the Brass Herald, right? The British publication. Yeah, I was a, a contributing uh, writer for the Brass Herald, and then uh, Philip Biggs, who uh, was the. the was the editor and publisher he passed away in 2019 suddenly yeah and so the publication is no longer being printed so but to be a part of it was uh quite special huh yeah and uh i really enjoyed my relationship with him and and uh i enjoyed writing there i am with winton he was over at orchestra hall and i came backstage to say hello to him oh, i took that picture and uh, <laughs> that mysterious voice. And my <laughs> wife took the photo for that, you know. Yeah. And look at this designed. Special. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. That's, uh, you know, uh, that's the um, Mute Meister. And here's one of the mutes right here. You see how it says Mute Meister? I, I designed these mutes that are manufactured by Terry Warburton down in. Um, florida and we're just now about to release the uh the trombone line of the mute meister mutes and uh, people will be hearing about that soon uh we have um, after a couple of years of uh play testing prototypes here with some of the best trombone pl jazz trombone players here in chicago we've come up with a cup mute a straight mute and a solo tone type mute for the cool. bone players and uh so we're field testing them now and everybody all these people that in the photos that, that you see me working with here and all these bands they love the mutes so it's going to be a great line of mutes that's one of the businesses that my wife and i created was the mute meister mute business i also have uh yeah i co-wrote that with josh rezepka and that book has done extremely well it's a a book of duets that you can play along with tracks and you know so uh that's been out for a couple of years now and uh that's one of the the last album i did of my own where i'm the, the, the soloist when i put these album that album out it was almost kind of like a sampler for band directors because i mm -hmm. i go out and i do of uh, clinics and guest solo spots with the uh, college and high school bands and i send them the record and say we can do I I any one of these charts you'd like to do you know mm. so uh it's like you know it's like you have to be kind of an entrepreneur to be a, a jazz lead trumpet player in this world and yeah that's the that's a new one that's coming out and it's just the production on it's just so great this is really going to be a huge deal. Mark Tremonte sings Frank Sinatra, the original real Sinatra arrangements on all this. And I played lead trumpet on the entire album. The, the mm. trumpet section was me, Kerry Deadman. I mentioned him before. He's one of the big producers around here in Chicago. And Doug Scharf and Art Davis, who are two of the greatest jazz trumpet players here in Chicago. You know, those two guys are wonderful. And Doug Scharf is on uh, Spanguli. <laughs> yeah, you know, have you ever yes. watched Spanguli? Yes. He's the piano player, trumpet player on that show. That's right. Yeah, That's awesome. which is like uh, filmed out of, out of. It's a real departure of. from what you'd expect. Exactly. Yeah. Well, see, he's got cool. his things going on too. You know. Mm hmm. It's like you know if if you everybody if, does you gotta if have you, the... if you try to put out and if you put out good products or honest products and if you're honest with people and if you know where you're at and, and you know it's like you put out some things that are, it, what i'm trying to do is provide a service yeah here's some great mutes it's going to help you play more in tune and get a better sound you know i have a whole line of signature trumpet mouthpieces that are made by Peter Pickett out of Lexington, Kentucky. You know, it's called a uh, Pickett Blackburn because he also took over the Blackburn trumpets. You know, it's it's like he. I have mouthpieces. You know, the Roger Ingram signature line trumpet mouthpieces. 
I got a couple books. I've put out some really nice trumpet mutes, and we're about yeah. ready to introduce the trombone mutes. And uh, and then so. I, I work with these big bands, and I teach, and I do clinics, and I'm busy all the time. And, but today, I actually got to go out and ride my bike. You rode your bike. Two hours, you know? <laughs> I have to acknowledge one person that is watching who was sort of a link here. Um, it says, good day, mate, Roger, the best ever C player ever, Roger Ingram, remembers doing the Miami All-Stars big band with Nicole Miller models at the Delano with Miami All-Stars big band for Paul Newman Charity, which you had uh, done, which I think is fantastic. So he was saying, he wanted to say a quick hello as well, because he was a key link in uh our connecting which i think is really really well, fantastic tell him I said, Hi, yes i remember Marty thompson yeah yeah Marty. i had uh billy spencer brian mcdonald you and the trumpet chair also had jackie gleason pianist liza minnelli's drummer also in that miami all-stars big band that was yeah we used to do I, those were my miami days when i had the place in miami and the place in new york and Peter Grace was contracting a lot of things. And, and that particular gig, I don't think it, I'm not sure if it was a Peter Gray's contract or thing, but, uh, but I remember those gigs well. And, and Marty's a great guy. He's a great player, you know, and he's kind of the one that uh, uh, hooked us up to do this, you know. He and his wife, Babette, say hello to, uh, to the two of you. Uh, they're sending you all their best. And, cool. Uh, Let them know I said hello. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, we do have, uh, yeah. She was say, he, he actually did say bring in the misses. So, here's my better half. <laughs> so, you know, that's fine. I'm telling you, it's like, you know, if you imagine 35 years, every meal you eat is from a restaurant and every bed you sleep in is at a different hotel because most of those gigs. We're one nighters. We were moving town to town every yes. day for ten months. It's unbelievable. Every year, you know. Yeah, uh, we got another one. It's only it's only like a little uh, over a minute, but it's uh, from the site. It's uh, Metamorphosis. Oh yeah, the, the, the New Standard Jazz Orchestra. Yes. Yeah, go ahead and play that. It's a great chart. All right, here and, it is. Gang. And, and Tom Garling arranged the 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 music for that it was wonderful yeah that is awesome again our very special guest roger ingram is here if you guys haven't had a chance subscribe to our youtube channel gym masters tv we have over 670 episodes with guests from broadway hollywood television film music stage culinary arts sports comedy and so much more you can binge watch all of them and uh, of course give this episode a like and uh you can drop a comment later on the uh, channel episode as well. Here it is, gang metamorphosis for you on the Gym Master Show Live. Thanks for all the chatter happening in the uh, JMS uh, chat room. We appreciate that as well, gang. You're the best. Here we go. Really nice, really nice. See yeah. what see what we what we see right there. We call that lovity on the Gym Masters Show live. <laughs> that is lovity. That was the uh, 
New Standard Jazz Orchestra under the direction of Andy Baker and Kim Partika, and the name of the album is Waltz About Nothing. Waltz. What is it? Waltz About Nothing. <laughs> and all you have to do is Google it, <laughs> and you'll find it. Or, or if you go to my website, which is rogeringham.com, I have a, uh, I have a uh, discography page. You get it. And a filmography page that lists all the records and everything. You know? It's all there. We do have one more we wanted to throw in. Uh, it's uh, you were a part of this, Ray Charles, America the Beautiful. Oh, I love this. Yeah. <laughs> I love this. I, 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 I'm, I, I'm telling you, the thing about Ray Charles, nobody had a delivery on a song like Ray Charles did. I mean, I learned so much about time and feel by playing lead trumpet on his band. <laughs> For about uh, three different tours, you know, they, they weren't concur concurrent, 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 <laughs> concurrent, and discography are not easy <laughs> words. <laughs> you know, I, well, you know, I read too much. You know, <laughs> and waltz with the Z. <laughs> That's funny. Here it is. Uh, and uh, so you were, I mean, you're playing with Ray Charles. I mean, he, you're very humble. I know you mentioned, oh, I was just on 10 days with Frank Sinatra, but what a 10 days. Well, I mean, I mean, I mean I'm mean, i very fortunate to have done it, but I mean, it's all great stuff. People can't associate me hardcore with Frank Sinatra because right. it's unfair to the people who spent who were hardcore with Frank. Decades exactly. With Frank Sinatra. I got to do one 10, 10 day tour, you know. Walt Johnson was with him for 20 years and you yes. should, should interview him sometime. You know, he's a great lead trumpet player. Here's with Ray Charles and of course, Saraja Ingram in there, America, the beautiful gang. Enjoy. Hey. Hey. I want to, I, 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 I have to do this because I figured that anybody that worked, that will work this hard deserve some kind of reward. Meaning what Ray? I'm talking about my drummer. Well, you know, well, let me explain. You see, he's he been practicing this lick ever since 345 this morning. <laughs> uh, and, and I know it because the manager came up about 415 or 420 or something and knocked on my door. And, and you know, I wasn't too happy about that. <laughs> but I struggled to my feet and I, yeah. He said, manager, man, what the hell's the manager? I was doing that. Mr. Charles? I said, yeah. Uh, sir, about your drummer. I said, he don't sleep here, sir. <laughs> uh, he said, I, I, I know, but there's, there's a problem. And uh, rather than to try to explain it, could you just come, to, just come to the outside of the door and just listen for a minute? And, and I have to admit, friends, I, I was shocked. When I walked out, I, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. My drummer, and I don't know where he found him, but, but he had French horns with him. <laughs> and they were going... tonight is this America sweet America And you know, when 
I was a little boy, I remember we always sang these words. Oh, beautiful. From spacious skies. From amber waves of rain. Bob Purple amazing stuff oh now she's on the other side of you boy she jumps around <laughs> yeah, well, i, I want to uh, mention a couple of things about that uh, that's fantastic that so victor vanacor is the conductor on that and uh the drummer is peter turi who's the brother of steve Ture, and uh the great jazz trombone player and peter and i were roommates on on ray's band we had a room on that band, so Peter was my roommate. Uh, the bass player is Tom Fowler of uh, the famous Fowler Brothers Air Pocket Band, and Tom Fowler is the guy who did all those early Zappa records. Like, yes. he used the bass player on, was was Zappa for years. There, the, there's a great uh, group of musicians: Walt Fowler, Tom Fowler, Steve Fowler. Um, Bruce Fowler. So he was out on the tour with us. But in particular, I want to mention that when you got that shot of me playing lead trumpet, uh, the trumpet player who was to this side of me, his name is Al Hood. And this was down done down in Miami. Uh, I just want to mention that Al Hood, and you can find him on Facebook. He slipped on the ice this winter, this winter, oh. January. And he has no feeling in either one of his hands or, or his either one of his legs, which hmm. technically would make him a quadriplegic. quadriplegic. And he hasn't had much improvement, and the money is running out. They have an active GoFundMe for Al Hood. Al Hood is a wonderful trumpet player. He's been an educator in Miami and for years he's been in Denver. in Denver 
a beautiful soul, a wonderful player. He's on the film here with me, uh, a wonderful jazz uh, improviser. And I just want people to know that they need contribu contributions to his uh, GoFundMe so he can keep on getting care. Physical therapy. In physical therapy. And his name is Al Hood, H-O-O-D. And I just thought about it when I was looking at the film. I said, oh, yeah, I was Beautiful. there. You know, yeah. I just thought of it. I told Vicky, I, I have to say, please contribute to his GoFundMe so he can continue getting care. This happened in January. He One slip on the ice changed his entire life. And, uh, you know, there's insurance issues and there's funding issues. So... Anybody who's, uh, you know, watching this, I, I would say this might be the, the most important thing I say on this entire show is please look up Al Hood, H-O-O-D, on Facebook, and you will see links for his GoFundMe, you know, so that maybe we can help him on his road to recovery. Okay. Very beautifully said. And to take the time to do that is amazing. You know, you also love to mentor and teach, don't you? That's a B as an educator. That's a, you know, we, we talk about the touring and working with these major people and you being so immersed in it for all these decades and years, but you like to pay it forward as an educator and teach others coming up the ranks as well. Tell us about that, Rod. Well, I had good teachers. And I was very fortunate that I grew up in Los Angeles during the 60s and 70s. I was immersed in a, a, a community of unbelievable musicians. I mean, I got to know Chuck Findley, who's like one of the greatest session trumpet players of all time. When I was just 14, you know, I started studying with Bobby Shue. He was one of the greatest jazz musicians and educators of all time you know and and i was and it was just a set of circumstances i just happened to be living in that city at that time and decided to do what i do and that was the time when la was like the breeding ground for all the tv shows and and record dates and all i can do to thank that set of circumstances is to try to pass it on and try to be as as good of an educator as I can. And one of the things about being a good educator is to be completely honest with your students. And if I don't know the question, the answer to a question, I just don't, I don't know. But sometimes you have to just figure it out for yourself. So what I try to do as an educator is give my students the tools and the knowledge to help them figure it out for themselves to help them to go after it for themselves. Uh, the only I, thing that I'm dogmatic about is to not be dogmatic in my approach to teaching, you know? Right. But here, and I encourage people to study with other teachers. Just figure it out for yourself. If you really want to go, I really wanted, to, wanted it. And I used to go around and bug people, you know, from the time I was... Before I could even drive, I used to take the bus from, you know, Eagle Rock down to Central Hollywood. And I used to go into Dominic Colicchio's trumpet shop and just ask him questions. I used to go into Bob Reeves' mouthpiece shop and ask him questions. I used to wait outside the studios for and see, you know, people coming out with their trumpets and stuff after they just finished doing a session. And I would... I would ask them questions and they were like, and I was only 14 or 15. I'd be taking the bus into Hollywood because I wanted to do it. I figured it out for myself, you know? Right. And they said, there's that kid. They used to, they gave me a nickname and they used to call me the walking question mark, <laughs> you know, because I was always full of questions because yeah. I really wanted to do it. And so if I have a student who really wants to do it, I give them all kinds of different interpretations of how to do this and how to do this. I say, okay, here's this guy's book. Here's Donald Reinhardt's dictionary on how to how to form your embouchure. Here's uh, the Costello system. Here's the Carmine Caruso system. 
check this out. I have them read all of these different, uh, you know, methods. And some of them are written in a very dogmatic way. And I say, don't let that bother you. So it's like, here's just another approach to how to play the trumpet. Here's another approach. Here's another approach. Read this approach. And from all of those approaches, and if you absorb all that information, then you figure out what's best for you, what works for you. And then one day you'll write your book. And this will be your approach, you know. I mean, I already put out a book. It's called Clinical Notes on Trumpet Playing. Oh, nice. Which you can, you know, go to rogeringham.com and you can go buy the book if you want to, you know. But, I mean, I came up with my own way of playing the trumpet. And in the book, I say, this is my way of playing, you know. I use, I've i taken trumpet lessons. I took a a trumpet lesson with William Vacchiano. I used to study with James Stamp. I took a mm. trumpet lesson with uh, Reynolds Schilke. I studied with Carmine Caruso. I studied with Roy Stevens. I studied with Jerry Callett. I studied for years with Bobby Shue. I studied with Laroon Holt. And one thing Bobby Shue said to me is, take as many lessons from as many teachers as you can and extract what seems real for you and disregard what doesn't seem real for you and roll it into a ball and create Roger's way of playing the trumpet. So you have to have an open mind. You, you can't just put all your eggs in, in one basket because when people write books about here's the way you're supposed to play trumpet, usually that's what worked for them because they're just just people like we are, you know? And so when I get together with trumpet students and people who want to play, what I'm telling you is basically what I tell them in the first lesson. I say, this is my viewpoint on how it works. Take it with a grain of salt and then go study with some other teachers. But, you know, remember everything I said to you. And even if it doesn't make sense now, Maybe on down the road, it'll eventually make sense too. you know. So as far as teaching is concerned, that that's my approach to it. You know, you know, when you look at this illustrious career and all the miles and all the music and all the memories, what are some of those continued blessings and joys in your life, Roger, that continue to propel you forward when you take time to really reflect on all of the incredible memories and music and, and more to come? Well, I try not to get hung up on my past accomplishments. I mean, like I tell my students, you're only as good as your last performance. That's right. You know, I mean, so I go in there and I I try my best. I get the gigs early. I prepare. I play every day. I mean, if, if there's a gig, if, if there's a day when I'm not working, I practice a gig's worth of time at home. And I keep my chops up, you know, especially being a lead trumpet player. They expect certain things from you, uh, you know, that, that are more physically de demanding than if I was playing one of the a third or fourth book in the section. So I got to keep my chops up and I continually listen to new artists coming out, which propel me and inspire me and piss me off. And I, I hear people, I'm just like, man, all right, I better start practicing. You know, <laughs> you know it's like I, I, I try to keep my thumb on the pulse of what's going on. And it's because, and it's a joy. Yeah. You know, I, I love it. And my wife and I, we're cool. I mean, you know, it's like we're fine. We're so cool. We are the That's coolest that. people. You are the coolest people on the planet. <laughs> well, you know, it's like I... I li and I listen to like some of my heroes, like Blue Mitchell. I listen to him all the time. I, and I try to figure out why he's doing that on that certain chord progression and what was he thinking when he did that. I mean, I'm constantly working on my improvisation too, you know. I'm improvising since I've moved here to Chicago. I've always been an ensemble player. I've always been the lead trumpet player. And I always did it from the attitude of a jazz musician. I always tell uh, lead trumpet players who want to play lead on a jazz band, I say, you have to remember it's still jazz. You have to kind of play like Chet Baker with chops. 
you know, try to phrase everything in a swinging jazz manner, you know. It's like you don't even have to be a great improviser to be a great jazz musician. Freddie Green is considered one of the greatest jazz guitarists in the world, and he never took a solo. He was on Count Basie's band for decades. But if you're going to play in a jazz band, even if it's just the lead trumpet chair, phrase like a jazz musician, think like a jazz musician, be a jazz musician. It's a jazz band, you know? Right. And so what I'm, so, you know, when you talk about improvisation, a lot of people, they say, well, a jazz player, they think that's just someone who improvises. There's like Jimmy Page was an improviser, but he was, he was doing it all within the framework of the rock and roll genre. Everybody improvises. That's one thing Bobby Shu said to me, he goes, Here, Roger, improvisation is not, it's not restricted to just the jazz genre. And he picked up his piccolo trumpet and improvised a classical piccolo trumpet solo. He says, that's improvisation. You're right. Mozart and Bach and Beethoven, they were all improvising. So on the other side of the coin, if you're not known for improvising, you can still be considered a jazz musician, even if you're a lead player, and especially with lead players, because you have to think like a jazz musician, you know? And the nice thing about being in Chicago after I got off the road being a lead player with all those bands for all those years, I'm actually working with Doug Scharf and Kirk Garrison, sitting down and just honing my improvisational skills. And the nice thing about doing club dates, like weddings and bar mitzvahs, and I get a chance, they say, take a solo on this mm -hmm. and do it now. You know, so I'm becoming more well-rounded and more mature as like, you know, an improviser now exactly. you know you know what i'm saying so yes you ask me what propels me and what keeps me going on i'm trying to become a better uh orchestral trumpet player and i'm trying to become a better jazz improviser although for years for decades i've been a jazz lead trumpet player okay that's a very very small category a jazz lead trumpet player you know i've been trying to broaden my horizon for years well you know somebody who uh has been around the block as well and was a seasoned veteran as well and honed his skills improvised often mr george burns yeah <laughs> there he is <laughs> <laughs> Everybody waits to see him towards the latter part of the show. He always pops in and he wants to tell you that uh, he thought you knocked it out of the park, kiddo, and he loved the conversation. And uh, he thought you and uh, your lovely wife are fantastic Thank people. You. I always enjoyed George. Me Burns. too. He was Wasn't he great? <laughs> you know, Bobby Shu told me about the time when um, he was attending some sort of a. Uh, gala event and Bobby Shu and his daughter Kelly got to sit down at a table with George Burns and mm. Bobby said that George Burns was so beautiful with how he handled meeting his daughter and it's something I think Bobby's daughter will never forget he says mm. he was just a beautiful cat you know yeah absolutely I never got to meet him he popped in. Well, you did tonight. <laughs> he popped in <laughs> and he had a great time with all of you and both of you and, and all of our the viewers watching. We thank all the viewers. This was, was amazing, Roger. We, you know, we said we chat for an hour. You know, we've done just about two hours of chat. Wow. It didn't wow. feel yeah. like it, right? Wow, you're right. <laughs> uh, here on the East Coast, it's about 10 o'clock. <laughs> but uh, this was really a blessing, truly, and an honor. And uh, you know, thanks for all the great music and continued blessings to you, to you both and the fellow musicians and artists. And uh, I hope the show met whatever expectations you had and you enjoyed the time with me well, as much as I have with you. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm very flattered that you would ask me to. Uh, here I am down in my basement. <laughs> and, and, you know, I have to tell you, I, you had asked me if I wanted to play, but 
you have to realize that I thrive in concert halls and I thrive in recording studios. And I'm in the basement of my house and I'm talking into a crappy little microphone that's on an Apple computer, you know, which are it's basically designed for human voice. When I teach online, it's such a challenge because when you start playing a trumpet into one of these microphones, the natural governor in the microphone just shuts it down. You know? Yeah, right. There's exactly. problems with that. So if anybody wants to hear me play, just get one of the records I play on, you know. Yeah, you, you go to my website, rogeringham.com, and you go to the discography page, and I'm I'm in my environment, in the recording studio or yeah. a concert hall, trying, pulling out my horn and playing here in my basement into one of these Apple computer microphones. I don't want to put that out there. <laughs> you know, um, it, it would go, for, for, wow. and it would just stop. I mean, it, it was... It would shut down. Yeah. Marty Marty Thompson has been begging quietly in the little chat room just to know the answer to this one quick question. And he just said he wanted to know if you knew French big band uh, Claude Bowling. Has he ever played his arrangements? Have you ever played French big band Claude Bowling's arrangements? You know, uh, Marty, um, I play with about... 10 big bands here and that's just here i've been playing in big bands all my life there's probably a chance i've played one of his arrangements it doesn't really stick out into my head so that means that if i did it wasn't terrible you know because sometimes i'll remember because <laughs> if it wasn't you'd remember <laughs> yeah i mean but no i have it and uh <laughs> It's an interesting question. Yeah. And uh, after we're finished here, I'll look, I'll look them up, you know, and see. Yeah, I saw pictures or something. You guys, have, you have like these boxes and boxes and boxes of, oh, all yeah. of these big band, the charts and three thousand like, arrangements. She was like, on the floor. Uh, she was yeah, a picture yeah. of her on yeah, the floor yeah, sorting yeah. them all the out. One, and the one good thing about the pandemic, we had a couple months to sort through yeah. all that stuff. And I'm and I'm going to do a project with that too. Yeah. I'm uh, we're putting together the funding for that. I mean, you know those bankers boxes. You know, and oh, yeah, the cardboard with the openings yeah. for the handles. Each yeah, one, if you put them sideways, each one of those boxes holds about 40 charts. Yeah, just Bill Holman arrangements alone. I have three bankers' boxes full of arrangements, <laughs> and and that's of 3,000 charts. And the library just kind of fell in my lap during 2020, and I'm going to do something with it and i'm making plans and it's going to be great but if you're going to do something well sometimes it takes a while to put it together that's it well this was really amazing my friend thanks for stopping by the gym masters show live yeah. series and spread the word about our show if you know of other folks you think would like to pop on and i thank you both for spending all this time and again hope you enjoyed the time with me and the viewers as much as i certainly have with you Thank you, Jim. And I just subscribed to your YouTube channel. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. That's fantastic. Right. I thought I felt a little tingle. That was me. <laughs> that was you. <laughs> you well, guys are the you, best. It was great. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. You are very welcome. You take care now. Be well. And hopefully we'll see you uh, soon, you know, somewhere if you're um, East Coast, New York area. So if okay, you're here. If we're in Chicago, I'll make dinner and we can go see a show. I well, like that. Well, you know, also on my website, if, if rogeringham.com, you go to the little menu <laughs> oh, at the like top of the page schedule. And, and you just click schedule. It tells you where I'm going to be. Fantastic. And thanks for spreading the word about being a guest on the show. I saw you do that on social media and everything. Yeah. And I appreciate that very, very much. And you guys. remember, contribute to Al Hood. Yes. All right. He Al needs, needs our help. He needs everybody's help. Yeah. That's beautifully said. All you right. Be, you guys, you take care and be well and keep the music playing, gang. Okay. okay thank you. Take care, Jim. Thanks. You, you bye bye. Well. Bye bye now. Yes. Wasn't that fantastic? The incomparable Roger Ingram joining us here live and direct from Chicago from his home. I was going to say from his studio and all, but from his basement, surrounded by equipment and boxes of music and so much more. And it was amazing. If you know him and you've been following him for a long time, then you got a chance to learn a little bit more about the man behind the music. 
here on the show. He doesn't say the word legendary, but but we do. He's been doing this a long time. He's worked with some of the greats. As you can tell, he's he is modest, but he is very, he's a super talent. I mean, how many times did you hear him say, you know, well, when the phone rang and then again, the phone rang and then again, the phone rang. <laughs> One minute it's Tom Jones and then it's Paul Anka and then 10 Thais on tour with Sinatra. Yes, he did work with Quincy. He did, uh, you know, Harry Connick Jr. for a long time. But of course, all these other fabulous orchestras and bands and, and group settings that he's had an opportunity to work with. You know, to, you know in addition to the, the well-known artists he's had an opportunity to, you know, spend some time with, he really, really celebrates and pays homage to uh, the bands and the orchestras that he's had an opportunity to be a part of as well, because it is like a family, you know, it really is like a family. And uh, of course, Woody Herman, of course, legend, and he had an opportunity to work with him, worked with Ray Charles as well. We talked about that. Uh, you got a chance to hear some clips, um, some great music, information about some of the instruments and uh, other incredible inventions too like that there he is with mel torme and it's just really really cool stuff uh here on the show and uh, this as well too yep you mentioned uh of course maynard ferguson was another fantastic legendary trumpet player um who is no longer with us but i have a lot of his material in our collection as well. I probably have material, all the names that he mentioned, <laughs> and maybe you do as well. The website is rogeringram.com. And uh, he makes his home and his life in Chicago. And it was really, really fantastic. So you guys are great. Thanks for all of this uh, great uh, commentary. And uh, I do got to acknowledge a couple of folks here. Marty Thompson did the uh, super chat during the live show. And I thank you very much for doing that, Marty. I help support our series. That's so kind of you and everybody who has been in our live chat saying some really beautiful things like Christine had said, gorgeous arrangement of amazing grace. It's so emotional. Thank you. And Kathleen in New York City, Christine watching in North Carolina, um, Sherry Larson watching. She loved Amazing Grace. She's wa watching in Kansas. Maureen in Arizona, Amazing Grace. It was my mother's favorite song, God Rest Her Soul, and you played it so beautifully. My eyes are leaking. See, that's what we do here at the Gym Master Show Live. We don't call these interviews. We call these conversations, and we have fabulous people who watch, and, and they open up about their lives, and they just get uh, some wonderful uh, enjoyment out of the show. So we'll say hi to some of the Merlin watching in Canada. She had welcomed Roger to the show as well. Thank you very much. Anne watching in Southern California. Also, one of our faithful Jameis Lovett is watching all the time. Mary in Florida. Good to see you, Mary. Thanks for being here as well. And uh, Linda in Florida as well. Good to see you, Linda. Just going scrolling back a little bit here. And Sherry in Kansas. Thank you so very much. Linda uh, welcomed Roger to the show as well. Uh, Roger, thanks you. I thank you. We all thank you. Rini Katz from New York City wonderful cabaret singer. Uh, she was with us as well. And she had said hello to all the JMS loveties and welcomed uh, Roger to the show as well. Good to see you, Rini, from New York City and, uh, and everybody else. Maureen welcomed uh, Roger to Lovety Hall. Again, we say there's a lot of that on the show. And uh, Sherry welcomed Roger. Mary welcomed Roger. Thank you so very much, gang. You guys are truly the best. Rini did as well. Uh, Linda loves our background screens. We welcome you as well. And thanks for all the great love. Um, we really appreciate it here. Take a look a little bit more. Mary, uh, Maureen says, uh, we used to refer to the Lawrence Welk show as grandma and grandpa's MTV. <laughs> That's, <laughs> you know, I interviewed a lot of the gang over the years from the Lawrence Welk show on PBS, public television, you guys know I've worked with them, because um, they'd come through and they would air the series for a long, long time. Jane watching in Sweden, of course, she's here saying hello and she welcomed Roger, part of our JMS Lovety Squad. We thank you, Jane, for watching as well. Christine in uh, North Carolina, hi Jim and 
Roger, welcome to the Gym Master Show. Interesting stories happening already. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for joining us as well. Christine, and um, really, really fantastic. Just scrolling quickly through here. You guys love Harry Connick Jr. And uh, some of the fantastic folks uh, that he's played with. Yeah, Paul Anker also wrote My Way, another legendary song. Uh, he had mentioned he also worked with Paul Anka, Marty Thompson, Babette Thompson in the house as well. Thank you, gang. Appreciate that. All these great comments uh, that are coming in uh, afterwards, and we appreciate that. Beautiful stuff. Really, really nice. And uh, you enjoyed all the photos, Kathleen, in New York City. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. And anybody else that's watching that's not uh, in that chat comment section. We thank you as well because a lot of people like to watch this later. Uh, so you can leave a comment on our YouTube channel, uh, you know, after the show at any time, 24 seven, we welcome that and, uh, good stuff. <laughs> and, uh, Marty, you did the, uh, you did it again. Thank you very much, Marty. We appreciate that. You're the best and, uh, really, really nice stuff. Yeah. It's, Good stuff. And Crystal was in the house. Crystal, good to see you as well. Thank you very much for being here, Crystal. And uh, more comments coming in afterwards. Yeah. Christine in North Carolina says, Jim, thanks for this entertaining show with Roger. I loved hearing about all the incredible musicians and groups he's worked with. Enjoyed all the clips and pictures. Roger is talented and a kind lovity. Absolutely. Class act too. Gang, you're the best. Marty says he was so glad to work with Roger Ingram. That's fantastic as well. Good stuff. Really nice, huh? Epic conversation. Crystal says, hi, Jim and everyone. Nice being back again. It's always nice when you are with us. You are with us. All right, gang, I want to let you know that tomorrow we've got a legendary guest. Oh, if you're looking for Michael Lernard, she is going to be here Wednesday. Now, it's at a special time. Uh, she had some technical problems earlier, so wasn't able to join us because she's not where she normally is. She's at a friend's house in the East Coast, and she's normally at home in Los Angeles. So she's going to be with us on, for those that are watching live, she played Olivia Walton in the Waltons. She's here this Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific. So hopefully you can join us. Michael Learned will be here this Wednesday at uh, 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific. That's a special time that we have created to work around Ms. Uh, Learned's very busy schedule. Sally Kirkland, the legendary actress, is with us tomorrow, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, live. Just Google her name, Sally Kirkland, and you'll see everything she's been in. Television, movies, stage extraordinaire, an epic legend. This is a Gym Masters show exclusive. We're so honored to have Sally Kirkland joining us here on the show. She is here tomorrow, and the, the roster of guests is continuing to be extraordinary and uh, really, really amazing from all different backgrounds. Every show is something different, unique for all of you. We thank Roger for joining us live and direct from Chicago, Illinois. And we thank all of you as well. We hope you enjoyed it. Good conversation, music, commentary, surprises, and all kinds of good stuff. And um, and Roger goes, nice show, Jim. You do good work. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. You guys are the best. And uh, Victoria, his lovely wife, Victoria, Roger and Victoria, we thank them both for, it was nice to have the bonus of Victoria popping in, huh? She was uh, instrumental in helping with some of the technical background uh, stuff as well. And Marty goes, uh, thank you for sharing a legendary trumpet player. And thank you, Marty, for all you do as well. To be very expressive, enthusiastic, passionate about our series, The Gym Master Show Live, supporting it, celebrating it, and telling everybody about it. We thank you very much, my friend, uh, Roger. Uh, we thank Roger, but we thank Marty uh, there in Nashville. And uh, he's a big supporter and fan of our show. Gang, give this episode a like. You can do that. We would love it if you do it. And if you want to leave a comment on the YouTube channel, feel free to do that. 
And if you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel, Gym Masters TV, we would love it if you do that as well. We're going to duck out of here. It was a real pleasure having you here. We don't say goodbye. We say see you later. Cheers. Ciao. Slancha. Shalom. Hasta la vista. Vida Zane. And, uh, and all the rest. We'll be back tomorrow. We thank you, 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 and you for joining us all around the world on this episode of the Gym Master Show live series. We appreciate you all and we thank you so very, very much. You take care, be well. We'll see you on the next episode of the Gym Master Show live. For those watching live, catch us on the next one. For those watching this later in the archives, stay right there. There's some 670 episodes and counting that you can watch in our incredible Epic Gym Master Show series. Lily is here. Welcome, Lily. Thanks for joining us. Good to see you. We got to have you come back on the show as well. You were a wonderful guest. So cool to see you as well, Lily. Thanks for joining us. And thanks, everybody. We appreciate you all. Be well. We'll see you on the next episode of the Gym Master Show Live. Cheers. <laughs>